The story continues with our main character, Vikir, facing off against the Cerberus after receiving a deadly blow from it. Vikir is unconscious as he lies against a tree. He suddenly awakens, wondering if he had lost consciousness after the direct hit dealt to him by the Cerberus as it walks toward him. He feels the pain in his left arm, thinking it might have been ripped out. He checks to see and is surprised to find his arm still intact, even if the Cerberus is wounded, he couldn't believe that its attack only did this much damage, thanking the River Styx's effect for helping keep his arm. As the Cerberus readies for another attack, it dashes toward him, smashing the tree behind him into bits. Vikir leaps out of the way before it can harm him, but he realizes that although his arm is still there, the damage remains, and he won't be able to take a second hit. As the Cerberus turns around, Vikir considers the situation as a journey that every experienced hunter must find a way out of. With the odds against him, he decides to run away as fast as possible. Alarmed by his sudden retreat, the Cerberus chases after Vikir, who thinks he is lucky that the Cerberus is injured, otherwise, he would have been torn apart by now. As he continues to run, his goal is to make it past the iron fence to exit the restricted area. Vikir leaps over the iron fence and readies himself to reach the place he had prepared beforehand as the Cerberus reaches the iron fence as well. If he is caught before reaching that place, it will be the end for him. The Cerberus rips apart the iron fence with its face, roaring loudly as it continues its chase. Dashing through the trees as fast as he can, Vikir looks around, wondering where the heck was the place he prepared. Just in time, Vikir spots the area where he had set up his trap. He notices a pile of wood in front of a tree, marking the spot. He runs with all his might, thinking to himself, just a little bit further. With the Cerberus closing in, he realizes it's the perfect moment and leaps into the air just as the Cerberus opens its mouth to attack. A single step forward onto a marking made up of small pebbles causes it to sink into the ground. Vikir lands on his back, completely out of breath, but safe from its attack, and breathing heavily, while the Cerberus is met with many wooden spears hidden in the ground below. He welcomes it to the cradle of swords. Wiping the sweat off his face, Vikir feels relieved that the traps he made for hellhounds were effective against the Cerberus. Bloody beans were spread onto the spears in the ground. Being the same species as the hellhounds, the Cerberus is easily poisoned as its two heads cough, vomit, and are in pain, while its middle head notices Vikir and growls at him. He holds a spear, aims it at the Cerberus, knowing that a high-ranking demon like it wouldn't die instantly, and throws it with all his might, but the spear bounces off its body, and the Cerberus growls loudly in response. Vikir starts to count down from seven. With each step the Cerberus takes, a second passes as it slowly reaches Vikir. As the countdown reaches zero, the Cerberus simply collapses to the ground. Letting out a sigh of relief, Vikir is pleased to see the Cerberus fall before him, confirming that the rumors about the seven steps were true. He explains that the wooden spear he threw was different from the others, it was laced with the poison from the bloody Mamba's venomous fang from when he was a baby, a poison which doesn't allow you to walk more than seven steps once you have been bitten by it. Vikir was glad he hid it when he was younger. After absorbing the mana from the Cerberus, indicating it is fully dead this time, Vikir stares at its corpse, wondering how to bring it back, but before that, he has something else to do. Vikir knew that the presence of a Cerberus meant one thing. Dungeons as Cerberus were gatekeepers that protected their territories. A dungeon was a mysterious place that harbors treasure, sometimes, powerful monsters would use them as their lair. Since its gatekeeper is dead, the dungeon is free to be explored. Our boy does the nasty, he decides to cover himself in the Cerberus poop, spreading it all over his body, making sure that he could avoid battling small monsters by using the scent of the Cerberus. Comment below if you're willing to do the same thing, covering yourself in poop. Using the dried soil, rotten leaves, and moist roots, Vikir backtracks the Cerberus by following its footprints and drool. He walks to an opening, saying, I found it. Entering the cave, Vikir recalls that the cave was meant to be discovered in a few years' time. As he stares deep into the cave, he feels its mana beneath the rotten surface, knowing it hasn't been discovered or cleared yet. No light was coming out of it, making the cave seem deeper than he initially thought. He smiles happily, eyes glowing with excitement, over the thought of the treasures that might lie within the dungeon as he slowly enters. As Vikir ventures deeper into the dungeon, he notices red veins of ruby minerals throughout the area, sensing they are connected to the Red All Mountain. When light appears before him, indicating the entrance to the dungeon, the brightness forces Vikir to cover his face with his hand. Entering a large room, he spots a floating red stone at the center. Realizing the dungeon's interior is bright due to the mana imbued into the ruby, Vikir approaches the floating ruby, but then notices something behind it, 
a skeleton with a note, showing that someone had been here before him. Inspecting the skeleton, Vikir sees injuries caused by stabbings and dried brown blood stains as he picks up the note on the ground. A long time has passed for the skeleton. Vikir reads the note and recognizes it as a Baskerville member's writing. The note reveals that the writer did not want to disclose his name and asks to be called Kane, as he felt that there was no need to dirty this pure white paper with his name. The reason behind the note was to prevent future generations from making the same mistake that he did. The note further explains that the stone chamber was talked about in the family as a legend, Kane writes that he and his brother Abel coincidentally came across this place while raiding the dungeon in its countless trials. They killed many monsters before arriving at the chamber, only to find the final assignment. This final assignment tied their feet there for a very long time, three years to be exact. Vikir couldn't believe the brothers actually stayed for three years, hinting that the brothers were desperate for the treasure and that the final assignment was somewhere in the chamber. He looks at the stand of the floating ruby and sees some writing, when entering, it's one, but once inside, it's two, when leaving, it's one, was the riddle written on the stand. The note continues, describing how the brothers contemplated the ominous text until they concluded that, because they were twins, they were once one in their mother's womb, but when born, they became two. Cain and Abel believed that to obtain the treasure, they had to become one again. This meant that only one of them could leave with the treasure. After a fierce battle, Cain ended up killing his own brother, leaving only one person in the stone chamber. But nothing changed, Cain wonders why the treasure did not appear even after killing his own brother, and he wonders why, screaming. He decides to leave, wanting to tell others who were brave enough to find this place to leave immediately, stating there is nothing to gain in this devil's den that only serves to taunt humans. Vikir concludes that the brothers did everything they could, only to leave empty-handed. Knowing he has no twin, Vikir believes that the brothers misinterpreted the text as he looks at the ruby, thinking about the riddle again. He thinks hard, knowing that no dungeon is unbeatable. Upon looking at the skeleton again, an idea comes to mind. Vikir figures it out, stating that the brothers were unlucky due to being twins and fixated on that idea. He mentions that the answer lies in the dungeon as he reaches for the ruby, saying that when he entered the dungeon, he was one, but as soon as the ruby light was cast upon him, he became two due to his shadow. Smashing the ruby into pieces, Vikir knows that without its light, darkness re-enters, making the stone chamber open its final stage. The riddle's answer was shadow. As pieces of the ruby fall to the ground, they start to rise up, and energy from the rubies opens the passageway in front of Vikir. He smiles happily as the final stage opens, revealing a sword, the relic of this devil's den, the cause of the brother's death. The sword glows red with an evil aura, the text below states that only those with Baskerville's blood can wield Beelzebub. He is shocked to find that the sword is Beelzebub as he stands in front of it. He recalls reading a picture book once during his childhood. It was about the gluttonous fly, Beelzebub, an unprecedented great monster that invaded the lands in the old legends as part of the devil's holy constellation called the Seven Calamities. To stand up against the Seven Calamities, the heads of each of the seven families took one each. The first patriarch of the Baskerville clan fought against the gluttony, Beelzebub. Remnants of Beelzebub were stored in the lands of the Baskerville. Its demonic energy was said to lure monsters, an old legend that no one believes now. But the legend was true, as the sword was later taken by the demon clans, resulting in countless deaths among humans on the battlefield. Vikir grabs the sword in excitement, saying that it won't happen again in this lifetime as the sword is now his. As he holds onto the sword, it lets out ferocious energy as if it were howling. He grunts loudly as the sword seems to be absorbed by his hand, leaving a black and red mark on it. The sword places itself into Vikir's hand before appearing as a blade from his arm. He mentions that he is lucky to have a blade made from a devil's holy constellation as the blade exudes a murderous aura. His red eyes glow, similar to the blade, as he raises it to his face, wondering how much stronger he will be in this life. Our boy was excited to find out. Looking around, Vikir realizes there is nothing else for him to take and prepares to leave. But he feels something is wrong with his body. Stumbling to the ground, he wonders what is wrong. Is he dizzy? No, he is hungry. Beelzebub was making a loud whining noise and Vikir wondered if it wanted to eat something. He leaves the dungeon, holding his stomach in hunger, noting that his sense of smell has improved as he smells something delicious. The sword pulls him along, much to his surprise making him wonder if there is something to eat in the direction it's pulling him toward. He reaches the corpse of the hellhound he had killed before. Beelzebub shoots out like a tube into the corpse. As it absorbs the blood, Vikir feels his insides getting back to normal, guessing that Beelzebub was starving for a long time.
he hopes the mountain's dried condition was not due to the sword's hunger and wonders how long it takes to feed it. But he also wonders how he was going to keep up with Beelzebub's insane binge eating disorder. Beelzebub makes a happy sound as it has eaten well and absorbed the hellhound's ability, hemorrhage. Vikir wonders if this is Beelzebub's inherent ability. Beelzebub was the glutton of flies and was said to possess the power to absorb its enemy's skills as its own. Since its absorption amount was close to infinite, many people lost their abilities and became obsolete. But due to it being hazardous, Vikir could only steal up to three skills for now. He describes the hellhound's ability, hemorrhage, as a skill that constantly pumps out the blood of its opponent even through the smallest of wounds. Realizing he can steal abilities, he looks at the Cerberus corpse. Beelzebub grows excited at the thought of feeding on it, but Vikir is alarmed and asks it to wait. He explains that he can't eat all of it because if it's too damaged, he won't be able to explain it during the autopsy. Thinking silently as Beelzebub makes constant noises while consuming the corpse, Vikir slaps Beelzebub, saying it's had enough. Though Beelzebub is upset, it has acquired two new skills, burn injury from Cerberus and high-speed regeneration from a sewer rat. Vikir was surprised to see this new skill, and spots the dead body of a sewer rat that was crushed underneath the Cerberus. Vikir picks up the rat, knowing that it was a great achievement to have acquired the burn injury skill from the Cerberus, since burning to death was one of the worst pains a human could experience, it was even much worse than the hellhound's hemorrhage. Now that he is done preparing the monster to submit for the practical exam, Vikir decides to wait at the practical exam site until it is over. When the young hounds gather back together, each of them was covered in various injuries. They would receive a shield, sword, or necklace as their reward based on the parts produced from the monsters they hunted during the practical exam. As monster parts are laid on the table, the senior members are astonished at what Vikir had hunted, and Hugo is alarmed to hear the news. Barrymore reports that during the practical exam, Vikir had accidentally crossed over into the restricted area, allowing him to hunt a Cerberus, a monster with a risk rating of A-. He further reports that it was wounded by the barbarian clan and that Vikir had applied poison to his wooden spear. Hugo mentions that a Cerberus is something that even the family's guardians would avoid. Hugo further inquires about the kind of poison that could kill a Cerberus and where Vikir had obtained it. Barrymore mentions that the report did not include such details and wanted to ask Vikir, but Vikir had returned to the dorm as he was too tired. Hugo compliments Vikir, acknowledging his slyness, and notes that information is power and power is your worth. Barrymore is shocked that a master named Van and not Lerla is this talented. Hugo responds that he himself is unlike the previous leaders, he doesn't discriminate against a hound based on its bloodline when raising them, as long as they have enough talent and spite. Adding that there are mutts from the royal bloodlines, he asks Barrymore if he understands him. Barrymore is concerned as he ponders whether Hugo is thinking about his second son who is preparing for isolation training, and apologizes to Hugo. Hugo says it's alright and asks for Vikir to be summoned. Vikir stands before them with a smile on his face. Hugo asks how he caught the Cerberus during the practical exam, and Vikir explains that he placed chocolate on his wooden spear, explaining to them that it's lethal to canine monsters. Hugo asks if that's why he asked for chocolate before, and Vikir confirms it. Barrymore wonders to himself if this is how fathers and sons usually talk to each other, as they didn't greet each other but just went straight into the topic. Hugo further questions Vikir on why he didn't respond when the butler asked him about the hunt, to which Vikir replies, he wasn't my master. Hugo then asks, who is your master? Vikir responds, the master of the clan, since I belong to the clan. Hugo is pleased with the reply and rewards Vikir with the corpse of the monster, in addition, he was willing to grant him a wish since our boy also scored the highest. Hearing that from Hugo, Vikir was thinking that he was finally getting what he wanted, so he requested access to the 10,000 Epistle Library. The 10,000 Epistle Library is one of the largest libraries in the empire and resides deep within the heart of the Baskerville clan. Hugo ponders, asking if Vikir knew that only the Patriarch and Second in Command, along with their direct descendants, are allowed to enter. Vikir says that if it is not permitted, he will give up on it, thinking that he needs to sneak in instead. To Vikir's surprise, Hugo grants him access and asks him to read the sixth technique of the family located within the sixth restricted zone deep inside the library. Vikir is stunned that he was given permission to learn a technique that an illegitimate child is not allowed to. There had never been a case where a child with the middle name Van was taught beyond the fourth technique. He even recalls that Hugo's current level is the seventh technique and that in his past life, Hugo had reached the ninth. Vikir remembers the discrimination he faced and promises that in this life, he will surpass Hugo. 
he will obtain the greatest essence of Baskerville, a textbook containing the teachings of the first patriarch who subjugated the seven great disasters. Hugo stares at Vikir, looking forward to his progress, and wishes him luck. Vikir bows his head, thanking Hugo and promising to surpass his expectations, with his eyes glowing red with hatred. As Vikir knew that Hugo would never realize the true value of the random book he just handed over to him. When Vikir enters the 10,000 epistle library, he stands there, saying out loud that this is the first time he has come in person. He searches through the swordsmanship books, seeing the names of the ones he had wanted to desperately learn in his past life. No matter how much mana an illegitimate child of the Baskerville had, they can't learn any swordsmanship that is superior to the fourth technique. In order to ensure that the children who become hounds do not bare their teeth towards their master, this was a defense mechanism the Baskerville family had created. Spotting a book locked with a chain, Vikir wonders if this is the book he needs. Taking out a key, Vikir couldn't believe that Hugo would offer him the book on the sixth technique, an opportunity that was never given to him in his previous life. As he turns the key in the lock, he wonders if Hugo thinks he couldn't memorize the technique in a day since he was just a kid. As he reads the book, Vikir recalls that in his past life, he had memorized the theory behind the first to fourth techniques until he was sick of it, he did it so he could deduce and speculate the theory behind the fifth technique. As he read the book, it tells him that he needed to stop the flow of mana after drawing the fourth tooth, Vikir wonders if that was the reason he could not make the fifth tooth. According to Baskerville swordsmanship, one tooth represents the first technique, the second tooth represents the second technique, and so on. When drawing a tooth, a special trait, a red sword energy appears. Flipping through the book, Vikir states that he doesn't care about the sixth technique and that the real reason he came to the library was different. Because what he wanted was a stage that was higher than what the book could provide, he returns to the guards, who are surprised to see him come out of the library so quickly. They ask if he left something outside and if they should get it for him, mentioning there are more books about swordsmanship deep within the library. He tells them that he has finished what he came for. When the guard asks if he wants to stay longer, Vikir declines, saying he wants to read other books and that they should do what they need to do in the meantime. As Vikir walks to the spiral staircase, the guards whisper to each other, saying that the place he is going to only has miscellaneous books, and that if they were Vikir, they would be busy reading the swordsmanship books deep within the library. They wonder if Vikir doesn't know the worth of the books, but Vikir chooses to leave them to their thoughts, knowing they don't realize the true value of the books in the miscellaneous section, as there was a certain treasure lying somewhere in there. Upon reaching the next floor, Vikir looks around at the books, noticing one that stands out. He found it, the book called A Lurking Ambush. Vikir is happy to find it as he was sure this was what he was looking for. Opening it, the book was on the basics of the first technique that the Baskerville children don't read. Due to the ripped pages, they considered it a useless boring book. But he grins widely, knowing he is the only one who understands its true worth. Recalling a memory from before his regression, Vikir remembers belonging to a hound squad that found a strange relic in the dungeon on the border of the La Rouge at Le Noir mountain. It contained a page from a swordsmanship book, a single ripped page. Written with Baskerville handwriting, only Hugo found this remarkable, ordering everyone to search through the whole library to find the book that matched the page. That book was a lurking ambush, the same one Vikir now holds. The book contains the tenth technique that the ancestors wrote. Vikir further recalls that Hugo went crazy over the tenth technique and released the hounds to find the remaining six pages containing the technique. Realizing the pages were hidden among the seven great families, Hugo declared war on them and sent hounds to those that refused. After sacrificing many hounds, all the pages were eventually given to Hugo. The reward for doing so was Vikir's death. Vikir grows angry as he remembers those unpleasant memories while holding the book, knowing that once Hugo achieved the ninth technique, it resulted in piles of hound corpses and blood. Vowing that it won't happen in this life, Vikir reminds himself that the pages Hugo got were all given by him, allowing him to remember the content on each page and that the reason he could not go past the fourth technique was the lack of access to the original book. Reading the book, Vikir realizes that without the other pages, the book makes no sense, but the moment you use the missing pages and fill in the blanks, the false and misleading information turns into a masterpiece of a book. He reminds himself that he had reached the highest level of graduator aura and the highest level of the fourth technique before he regressed as he reads the book, knowing that before he turns 15, he must reclaim the power he had before his regression. Night turns to day as Vikir immerses himself in reading the book. After finishing, he wonders if he spent the entire day reading, but thanks to that, he was able to memorize the book's contents from start to finish. 
Looking around, Vikir does not sense the presence of the Guardian Knights. He closes his eyes, thinking that right now, he couldn't draw the tenth teeth with his current body, but if it's right now, he wonders if he could achieve the fifth technique that he couldn't reach in his previous life. And so, he imagines a figure standing before him as his arm glows with a red aura. Opening his eyes, he strikes the figure using the first technique, continuing the strikes and moving on from the first to the second technique and more. He grits his teeth as he thinks of his past self as pathetic. After working hard to reach the highest level of graduator aura, Vikir was unsuitable to learn a proper sword technique, making the direct bloodline hostile to him. The main reason he couldn't go past the stage of the fifth technique was that he was an illegitimate child. Dashing to the side of the figure once again, he asks if they thought he would live the same way again. As he approaches the figure, it transforms into the older version of Hugo. Vikir slices Hugo relentlessly and exits the imaginary space. Breathing hard, he looks at his hand, thinking he is still weak and wondering if he actually drew out the fifth tooth. Clenching both his fists in victory at his achievement, it felt like something hot from deep within his heart emerged and shot up to his neck. Vikir was so happy at the fact that he could do the fifth technique to the point he could cry. Continuing to look around, he wonders if there is a sword nearby to test the fifth technique again. At a record-breaking speed in Baskerville history, a young hound's canine teeth bared towards his master were growing. Finally succeeding in drawing the fifth tooth, Vikir believes he can reach the level he was at as long as his mana can support it. Smiling happily, he notes that his mana capacity has increased and reached another level. A red liquid aura covers his hand, showing signs of a graduator. Vikir has gone from a high-class sword expert to a low-class graduator, a point that had taken him 30 years to reach, but he has reached it at 8 years old now. Graduators are on a whole different level compared to sword experts, as their aura turns from solid to liquid, increasing in density and allowing for it to be used more freely. Knowing his swordsmanship is better now and that he can reach the 10th technique means endless possibilities. Piercing Fang was what he learned before, which allowed him to grow stronger in a short period of time, but had limitations. However, the lurking ambush is the perfect sword technique that can transition between offense and defense with no growth limitations. Placing the book near the window, Vikir contemplates challenging a mid-class graduator and believes he has a 100% chance of assassination and about 50% if they face him head-on. The only problem now is how much to show Hugo. Vikir knows he can't reveal too much or too little of his strength, he needed to give Hugo something to look forward to, so he could have enough time to take everything he needed. He then takes out a silver object from his pocket and places it in front of the book, using the sunlight to start a small fire on the book. Grinning to himself at what he has just done, Vikir sets the book aflame, making it impossible for others to reach the tenth technique, and ensuring that he is the only one who knows how this time. As the guardian knights appear behind him, they ask what the smell is. When they question Vikir, he replies that he accidentally left the magnifying glass around and burnt the book. The guards are relieved to hear that only a useless book was damaged. Vikir asks the guards if they should bother with such a small thing since there are bigger problems to handle. The guards agree to keep it a secret if Vikir does as well. Vikir agrees and proceeds to leave. The guards are pleased, thinking of him as a nice person deserving of their respect as he walks away with a smile. When Vikir appears before Hugo and Barrymore once again, Hugo asks if he has reached enlightenment. Vikir replies, sort of. Hugo asks what he has learned, and Vikir mentions that he felt something warm and sharp yet soft and viscous. Both Barrymore and Hugo are alarmed at hearing this, and Barrymore wonders if it was an aura. Aura, the sign that you have officially entered the world of the sword, this was something only geniuses could only reach at 15 year olds after years of training, in order to reach the level of a low class sword expert. Hugo thinks to himself about why he is getting excited over an 8 year old and asks Vikir to show him, to which Vikir accepts happily. An arena is showcased, and many young masters are confused as Vikir is seen standing with a sword. Barrymore asks Hugo how he intends to test Vikir's skills, and Hugo replies that a monster will be released, a hungry and fierce one. The gate opens, and a huge orc exits, chained all over its body. It growls loudly with menacing red eyes. Other young masters in the stands are shocked, wondering if an eight-year-old can take on an orc by himself. Standing face to face, Hugo signals the knight to remove the orc's chains. It screams out powerfully and rushes toward Vikir. With a calm expression, Vikir slices the orc's arm off with a single swing, shocking everyone present. The orc is stunned by its wound, and Vikir wastes no time, dashing low to slice its leg off in one strike again, causing the orc to fall to the ground. 
The orc remains confused, not understanding what has happened to it. Vikir looks back, thinking that the orc is confused about why it's bleeding for the first time and that its regenerative skill won't activate. It's due to the skill of the bloodhound, which overpowered the orc's ability. People in the stands are left wondering how Vikir is that strong, while Hugo stares, deep in thought. Vikir looks at him, knowing he is trying to determine what he learned in the library, and proceeds to show him what he wants. Hugo and Barrymore look alarmed as Vikir reveals his aura blade, with his sword covered in a strong red aura. The orc tries to get up, but senses a red presence approaching it, only for its head to be smashed to bits as Vikir slashes through it like butter with a quick dash, his sword enveloped in the aura. Hugo is shocked, seeing that red aura from Vikir, while Barrymore congratulates Hugo on witnessing the birth of a genius, leaving Hugo wondering if that was all. Barrymore further states that he hasn't seen this kind of talent from the other families, but Hugo stops him, noting that something was wrong with the orc. Seeing its blood not stopping even though orcs are famous for their regeneration, he pushes Vikir's victory as a result of the orc being weakened, while Barrymore wonders why he can't express his happiness. Vikir then calls out to his father and asks if there is anything stronger, with a smile on his face, surprising Hugo. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.